Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. There are events in history well documented and agreed upon, but as is the way with many things, there are those that are not. It's pretty much agreed that the first settlers to come to the Berkshires, after of course the Native Americans who've lived here for eons, were those who came to Sheffield from Westfield. They followed in the steps of the son of the founder of Springfield, Massachusetts, John Pinchon. He headed out into the frontier to make a success of himself by setting up a trading post along the Housatonic River, along what was a scarcely traveled route to the New York Dutch settlements, like New Amsterdam and Albany. But his choice of location was poor, as not enough people passed by to support his business. And though he had hoped travel would increase with time, his venture couldn't weather the weight, and he was forced to close up shop. It did, however, make others aware of the area, and curious settlers ventured to it and founded the town of Sheffield and the village of Ashley Falls. There are many notable names who were the first to settle a great many Berkshire places, and I'm certain they'll end up in their own episodes. But there is another tale that I've been trying very hard to verify as fact for quite a while now, but haven't been able to find much. Still, this story does exist, so I'll have to tell it with an air of folklore, which in the end, it probably is. Thankfully, that happens to be part of our tagline, so here it goes. Diedrich von Kiefer was a young Dutchman, living in New Amsterdam, the place that would later become New York City, when it was little more than a village. He and his wife, Wilhelmina, were relegated to the edges of society. It wasn't for any horrible crime, but instead for being in love. The two had hidden their feelings for each other for a long time, when finally they decided to wed in secret. A pastor, moved by their devotion, agreed to perform the ceremony. Afterwards, they continued to hide the fact from their families, even living in their respective families' homes, while Diedrich tried to save so that they could have a home of their own. But somehow, the secret came out, and their families were outraged. The pastor who'd wed them was shamed, and forced to repent for his folly, and the community thought it best to annul the union. After much squabbling, it was decided that what was done was done. So instead of being forced apart, they were instead shunned. It was even recorded into the church record on May 6th of 1633. They could no longer attend church, which was the pillar of their settlement, though work was not as scarce as company, since Stiedrich was a skilled joiner, and those skills were needed in the growing colony. But the lack of socialization with anyone but themselves got to the couple, and they soon decided that it would be better to be totally alone than alone among their peers. So one night, without saying farewell to anyone, they packed their things onto horses and a few mules, and before daylight, they ventured out into the unknown. They made their way northward, through the forests where there were no roads, to the end of the island of Manhattan, and crossed the river there. Then, they continued, on and on. They weren't certain of what they were looking for. They just thought that they'd know it when they saw it. Traveling for many days, camping at many lovely sites, none of them seemed quite right. But then the land around them began to rise, into mountains. It was here that Diedrich decided to find a gap and cross eastward into them. As they traveled along the peaks and ridges, they spied from far off a native village. This was on land that would later become Great Barrington. The couple carefully avoided being detected and journeyed around. It must have seemed like a great distance away at the time, but not that far away. They came to a beautiful and placid lake. Here seemed right. Here seemed like the perfect place to set up home. Food was plentiful in both the water and the forest, so Diedrich began to build a cabin. It would be a lovely little cabin, and cozy with a fire in its hearth. Wilhelmina and Diedrich were delighted and hopeful about their new start in life. They wouldn't remain alone in the wilderness for long, as they soon were made parents with the birth of their daughter, whom they named Gertia. The years rolled along, and Diedrich cleared a small patch so the sun could shine into the dense forest, and he could farm. Little Gertja grew into a strong, smart, and adventurous child, but her parents began to worry a little. She was a free spirit, 
not bound by the restrictions of their own culture. She could wander and explore the wilds every day and come back safe, happy, and with new discoveries to tell her parents about. But a time would come when she would want a life of her own, and here there was no one to learn the social norms from but her parents. No good Dutch boys of their own faith with whom to fall in love. This wild child would be an outcast back home. What were they to do when they themselves could not return? There were other Dutch settlements popping up here and there, but Diedrich and Wilhelmina had been so far cut off from news of the outside world that they did not know this. Besides, this was home now, and they loved it here. At about the age of six, Gertie's parents heard her calling, and they went outside to see. There she was, leading someone out of the woods, a native boy, about her own age. Her parents were startled as their daughter chattered on about how they'd met. They weren't wary of the boy, but rather the fact that now his tribe would know where they lived. Soon it seemed the boy grew tired of not understanding what everyone was saying, and had probably picked up on the fact that his new friend's parents were speaking with some concern. So after a glance of understanding to Gertje, he turned and jogged back into the forest. Gertje's parents couldn't tell the lonely girl no, however, so the friendship was allowed to continue. Gertje took to calling the boy Little Fox, but as she slowly learned his language, she came to know that his real name was Young Eagle. The first nickname, however, stuck, and it indeed came to pass that the native boy's father, Big Bear, visited the cabin. Big Bear spoke some Dutch, having done many trades with settlers along the Hudson. This was, of course, new news to Dietrich, who had before had no knowledge of these new settlements. He also learned that these were not the natives he had seen camped in Great Barrington, but rather natives that had moved recently to just the other side of the lake, and that they were a group of the Pequot nation. Big Bear invited Dietrich to his village, where they smoked a peace pipe and promised friendship. And it was friendship that indeed lasted. The little family was delighted to have company, and the natives really treated them as part of their community. They shared planting and hunting techniques, and took part in each other's celebrations. One of those was probably Gertia's twelfth birthday. She'd reached the age that young ladies begin to wonder about love, and she thought aloud one day if her fate was to marry her dear little fox. Her parents spoke up. They told her not to think such nonsense, that she was too young anyway, and that when she was old enough, her parents would find her a nice Dutch boy that she'd love even more than Little Fox. Gertia seemed unimpressed by their argument and promises, but she agreed to wait. More seasons passed, and Gertia grew taller, as did her dear Little Fox, and their friendship did indeed grow into young love. It was obvious that Gertia adored her handsome little fox, and that little fox was wholeheartedly dedicated to Gertia. This time Gertia's admission of love for her little fox to her mother and father was met with her father outright forbidding it. Upset by her parents, Gertia pointed out that marrying without parental approval and living in the woods were practically family traditions. She bid her crying mother goodbye and called her father's bluff when he said that if she left that cabin she would never be allowed to return by running out the door and into the woods. Her mother shouted, Go after her! Diedrich, startled into inaction by his daughter's brazenness, suddenly found his senses and obeyed his wife. It had been a bluff after all. They had all come to love Little Fox and his entire family as well. It was just that if Gertia became his wife, she'd be expected to live the life of a native woman. It was hard work to keep house in a cabin in the woods. It was still harder, in Diedrich's opinion, for a wife to keep house in a wigwam in the woods. He worried for her future. He worried that she'd end up as little more than a beast of burden for her husband. As a modern woman looking back at the story, I don't think Diedrich actually had all that much a grasp on how tough life was for almost every woman at the time. New world, old world, native or not. Diedrich headed as quickly as he could for the native's village, where he was sure she would have gone. But when he arrived, he discovered that no one there had seen her. Little Fox was distressed to learn that Gertia was missing, and went with Diedrich to search for her. He knew some of Gertia's favorite spots to hide, and hurried ahead 
so much ahead that Dietrich almost became lost and was forced to turn back. He decided to return home to see if his daughter had changed her mind and come back to them. But when he got there, he only found his worried wife, Wilhelmina. A while later, they heard voices outside. Up the path walked Little Fox and Gertia. Upon seeing her parents, she asked for forgiveness. After Little Fox said goodbye and left, the family entered the cabin as Gertia spoke. Her father, however, could not listen. So hurt, he stepped back outside. But Wilhelmina and Gertia hugged, both understanding what it was like to be willing to give up the way they were raised for the man they loved. It was decided that fighting was senseless, that their daughter and the young brave would marry. The next morning, Diederik went to talk to Big Bear. Gertia and young Eagle would be wed, for good Big Bear was overjoyed. He only had his son, no other children, and the prospect of having a daughter-in-law and then grandchildren meant the world to him. And his son was so much in love with Gertia. He wanted only for their happiness, which in turn fostered his own. They didn't wait long. For a short time later, the two were married, with all the joy and ceremony that was called for by both traditions, or with as much of the Dutch tradition as could be furnished, as there was no preacher to bless the union. All in all, it was a wonderful event for both families. Gertia moved right away into a wigwam with her husband, and began her life as his bride. She began to wear the traditional clothing of the tribe, and wear her hair as they did, to don the simple adornments that they did, and learn to speak their tongue more fluently. Her parents, as usual, worried. She was their only child. How could they not? And yes, she was the wife of a native man, but she was still a Dutch woman, and they only wished that she would retain some of what they had taught her, to be proud of her own heritage, as much as she was the one she'd adopted. Daughter and parents would often visit each other at their respective homes, and Wilhelmina was happy to bring the evening meal down to the wigwam of her daughter, as it seemed that dear Gertia was working all day, every day. Her mother managed to have the odd evening to sit and read the Bible or work on a piece of embroidery for fun, but her daughter seemed to do nothing for herself at all. The seasons passed, and soon a few years. By the third, there was an obvious change in their daughter's personality. Previously bright as the clear sun, she was now serious and tired. It didn't help that their first child was born weak and listless. It didn't live long, and poor Gertia drifted into grief. Her once loving husband didn't seem to know how to console her, and instead became cold and distant. Perhaps they had done something wrong to displease the spirits, to deserve such a tragedy befalling them. Now, not only did she have to work all the time, not only did she lose their child, but she also felt terribly lonesome. Sometimes she would flee her drudgery, paddle a canoe across the lake, and hide under the thick trees on its bank, where she would cry her tears for as long as they'd come. One day, a figure came up the path to the cabin. No, two figures, one carrying the other. Gertie's parents were horrified to find that it was Little Fox carrying the lifeless body of their dear little girl. She'd paddled across the lake that day to cry her tears at the other side, but had gazed perhaps for too long into the pure, deep waters of the placid lake, the calm and peaceful lake, and she'd found herself longing for that peace, the strange joy with which the sun dappled the shallows, the glistening ripples on the surface, the timelessness. She'd thought of it before, of walking into that water, into beneath it, of never coming to the surface again, of being that peaceful. Little Fox didn't know if that was what actually happened, or if her canoe had turned over and she'd not meant to drown. But in the end, the result was the same. Her parents cried with horrible grief. Little Fox hung his head in sadness, before silently lifting his arms toward the sky for a long moment, and then soundlessly turning and walking away, leaving them and his wife behind. Her parents buried their once bubbly child in the sunniest spot at the edge of their clearing. After a few days of deep sadness, they attempted to continue about their daily tasks as one does, and found comfort in each other. But both families felt the loss heavily, and something within Wilhelmina never recovered. She instead, it seemed, began to falter and slowly grow frail. Through the months, she became lean and weak, and her husband fretted for her health. What would he do without her? But there was nothing to be done. She faded beyond recovery, but in her last moments, she didn't fear 
Instead, she looked forward with warm hope to seeing her daughter again. Diedrich was devastated anew. Unable to handle the task himself, his native in-laws helped him bury his wife beside his daughter in the same sunny corner, not far from the lake that took their child. That lake would, in the distant future, be known as Lake Buell. Time went on as time does, unceasing in the face of tragedy. And with enough seasons, Little Fox took a new bride. Diedrich was offered the hand of a fair native woman or two, and a wigwam of his own, in the village of his friends. Big Bear was worried about him, up there in his lonesome cabin, but Diedrich didn't want to move quite yet. As he grew older, doing all the work in the cabin was difficult on his joints, and he began to spend more time in the village. He was already dressing in their traditional way, since he had no access to cloth, and mending his tattered clothes had become impossible. He joined in all of their celebrations and ceremonies, until finally he took up Big Bear's offer and married a lovely woman he'd taken a liking to. He was content. He still missed the family he'd lost, as anyone does, but here he was building a new life. A few years later, his trusted friend Big Bear passed away, and a brave from another tribe came to them. He was asking them all to join with Prince Philip of the Wampanoag, in his battle against white encroachment on native lands. Diedrich was so far removed from his white past that he hardly thought anything of it, when Little Fox, now the chief, and going by his given name of Young Eagle, agreed to help the other tribe. Diedrich didn't even know that the Dutch no longer owned New Amsterdam, and that it was instead New York. He was getting on in years, but would not be left behind when the men of his village went off to fight, and with his sun-tanned skin, Indian clothes, and war paint, you could have hardly picked him out as different from the others. They fought in battle in August of 1676, and were valiant, but eventually were driven back. They thought about returning to their village to regroup and resupply, but were intercepted with word that they were being followed by the English. So they turned away from home, and instead headed into Great Barrington, to the same village that he and Wilhelmina had so carefully snuck by when they first ventured into these mountains. It was there that they camped, but the white soldiers found them and attacked. Many braves were killed. Afterward, as the English searched the dead, one of them turned a body over and was startled to find a white man laying there, his war paint mostly wiped from his face and his blue eyes partially open. The soldier was not mistaken. He called his superior over, a Major John Talcott. It wasn't just that they'd found a white man among the natives that was a curiosity, but also that one of the English's Mohegan allies had scalped him. They discovered his name, written in the front of a tiny Bible he'd been carrying with him, and a tiny porcelain portrait of a lovely blonde woman. These things were taken and carried until the end of the war. When they were returned to the closest relative that could be found, his body was buried, but it's not known if it was by the English or by his native family, and no one knows anymore where he now rests. Diedrich's story would seem to end here, but the legend has a little more to it, as legends often do. There's a story from old New York that goes like this. About the winter of 1676, an aged man could be seen wandering the cold streets of the bustling town. He dressed oddly in deerskins and moccasins, and he spoke little other than to beg for a little bread. At night, the winters being so cold, he was allowed to sleep in the usually empty jail. After some prying for information, New Yorkers curious about this stranger were able to get a little history from his muddled mind. He couldn't remember where he was when it had happened, but he recalled being badly hurt and left to die, and he could remember a war between Native Americans and whites. He said that a native found him and nursed him back to health, but that all the man could remember was that he used to live in New Amsterdam, so when strong enough, he headed there. Almost right away, he'd been confused, because the place had a different name and had grown so very much, but he managed to find the older section of town. It was there that a town watchman had found him on the doorsteps of an abandoned old home, calling for his wife to come out. When he was taken to the town hall, he was offered help. People were found that still spoke Dutch, and they asked him about who he was and who his family had been, his parents, his wife, anything, but he knew very little. The townsfolk dubbed him Pete, sometimes Crazy Pete, and let the poor old man do as he would. He was kind and harmless, and the people of the town of New York came to adore him. It's said that he died at a very old age, 
and that the town paid for his burial. It's also said that Pete was very easy to identify, as his head was deeply scarred, as though he'd been scalped. This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Grenier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You can also find episodes on Twitter and Facebook, as well as at our website, www.theberkshiresgoneby.com. Photos related to Berkshire history and images related to our topics can be found at all of these places. If you want to email us, you can send email to theberkshiresgoneby at gmail.com. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.